What is going on, everyone? Welcome to 2020, and welcome to the Laugh to Learn podcast, your weekly source for a comedic spin on all the goings on in the world. My name is, as always, Jacob Paveo, and I come to you from the Great White North every Tuesday evening, Eastern Standard Time, fresh for download to listen to at work Wednesday morning for everyone, the entire world around this podcast as as it always has, continues to come to you completely ad-free. And all that I ask is you subscribe on any podcasting platform or over on YouTube. Although, let's be real, it's time for me to stop talking about YouTube because I don't really promote it and ain't nobody listening there. And tell your friends about me, either in person or with a share over on social media. Also, if you have a second while you're in your podcasting app, which I know you have to be there because you're listening on your phone right now, let's be real, 90% of you, actually the statistic is like 98.3% of you listen on a phone. So if you could jump over into the podcasting app of your choice, give us a five-star rating over on whatever it is, Apple Podcast. Uh, Spotify doesn't let you actually, so that was a dumb thing to jump to. Um, maybe the Podbean app, which is, of course, uh, our gracious host, uh, because it is great help to us and it helps us show up higher in searches in all of those lovely different places. So I want to start by saying a happy new year, a merry Christmas, a happy Hanukkah, and a Festivus for the rest of us to us all. I hope you all enjoyed the holiday season wherever in the world you happen to listen from. It's pretty awesome. We've got viewers all the way from Australia to Canada, which is literally the entire world around. Um, but it's uh, it's back to the grindstone once again. Uh, I'm sure you've all been back to work for at least a few days now if you had any time off. Personally, I had planned to take a few days off, but I ended up having emergency accounting duties, which I learned this past two weeks. Um, apparently, that does exist. So I have yet to really take any holidays, um, but I will get to that towards the end of the show. For anyone new to the podcast, I'd like to say welcome. And for those returning, I say a casual sup. I encourage everyone to go back into the archives of the show. Maybe you've been a long-time listener and missed an episode or two. Or if it's your first time here, pick out a podcast episode with a uh, a title or a, a topic that sounds uh, cool and interesting, and uh, feel free to check them out. Uh, they're there forever. So the, uh, the Canadian election episode is one that I've been told was many people's favorites. Um, it was one of my favorites to record. I've mentioned that a few times in the past, so um, if you're curious about other episodes to listen to, maybe go give that a download and listen to it this week while you wait for the next episode to drop on Tuesday. There are 42 other episodes, so if you dig this episode, uh, jump back in, download any of those other 42 episodes, and uh, I hope you enjoy the listening to them as much as I enjoy making them. This week, we will be going over the active situation in Iran. I'm assuming everyone has heard the basics by now, but my goal here on the Laugh to Learn podcast is to give you the information you didn't yet have, and then I also add in some opinion and some uh, dad-like humor throughout the episode to really bring these news stories down to earth and make them relevant in each and every one of our day-to-day uh, -day lives. After we go over Iran, I'm going to be keeping everyone abreast, which is a word that I'm quite the fan of, of my goals for the podcast this year. Some things that I'm really excited about and eager to share with you all. So stay right where you are. Don't hit pause because this is the Laugh to Learn podcast. Hey, check it out. It's the Laugh to Learn podcast. <laughs> All right, we're going to take this Iran story all the way back to the beginning to ensure that absolutely 
everyone is caught up on exactly how we got here today. Once, every bit of matter you see around you, and all that reached out to the farthest points of space, were all condensed to a point smaller than a speck of dust. Fast forward to May 2018, A.D., Earth, American President Donald Trump, um, known here on the show as Doofus Donald, signed an executive order to remove the United States from the Iran nuclear deal. Now, politically, this move was viewed very differently depending on what side of the aisle you happen to support. Democrats across the nation were against the move, saying that Iran would now develop nuclear weapons and that it was a more a pro-Russia move to help their oil ally, that being Russia's oil ally, whereas Republicans, conversely, were in favor of the move as the deal had originally freed billions of dollars in Iranian funds, which could now be used to support anti-American projects and terror um, and they did not believe that Iran would stay true to the deal either way, even if they had stayed in the agreement. Now, there's a lot that can be said about the Iran nuclear deal, but I do not have that kind of time. So after he pulled out of the deal, he being uh, the president, President Donald J. Trump, over the next 12 months, nothing major happened. Really, the world continued as usual. Everyone panicked at first. It was like, oh my god, and then nothing. But Something huge actually did happen because the Laugh to Learn podcast was launched in January of 2019. So that's a pretty big deal. But other than the launch of this podcast, no missiles were launched, no nuclear weapons were created, as far as we're aware. And um, really, Iran stayed in the deal with several other nations, including the European Union and Canada. There was no overt threat, no threats made, nor any major moves made by either side for that entire year. That is, until exactly one year later, in May of 2019, Iran completely scrapped the nuclear accord and announced it would be moving to increase enriched uranium production, which went completely against the deal. Now... It's important to note that uranium in a stable form that you would mine from the ground is, of course, dangerous and radioactive, obviously, though it's not useful as weaponry. A military needs to um, enrich the uranium, is what we call the process, and it's a means of essentially destabilizing the element to a point where it becomes highly volatile and explosive, which is a fancy way of saying that um, we have to do a bunch of stuff to it to make it go boom. And that way it becomes what we really know nuclear weaponry can be. Now, this is a very difficult, expensive, and dangerous process. And as of today, it at least appears that Iran is still working things out with their enrichment procedures. We really don't see evidence that they have a physical working um, nuclear device. Nuclear weapon, I should say. But later that same month... Iran began to attack foreign oil tankers. So this is in, again, May of 2019, moving into late May, early June. Primarily, oil tankers that were moving oil from rival traders in the United Arab Emirates, or the UAE. This is a story that we covered last year on the podcast. We had a whole half an episode about it. And you may recall that Iran, who still to this day deny the charge, although most foreign nations agree it was most definitely them that did it, Um, Iran had planted mines along the international waterways of the Strait of Hormuz, seemingly allowing their own ships to pass safely through, but mining, uh, and by mines I mean like physical mines underwater that make you blow up if you touch them, like in Finding Nemo, the balloons, remember? (laughs) So allowing their ships to pass through safely, but striking any foreign ship that happens to come across the 1930s style weaponry. And these attacks have actually continued to be a threat to this day. Now, of course, uh, the strait is identified as international waters by everyone else, but Iran says it's their waterway that they control. So it's still very contentious even to today. Now, moving on from uh, late May into towards the middle of June 2019, Uh, You may also recall we talked about uh, Iran shot down an unmanned American drone over what Iran claims was Iranian airspace. 
The American government has released uh, flight data, which appears to show the plane remained over the strait, which is in international airspace. But this is obviously something we can't really take sides on. Uh, well, we can take sides, but we can't take other side's word on it because, you know, the U.S. is, of course, going to say they didn't do it. And they, of course, have the technology to lie and be like, look, we never flew over there when they may have. And Iran, or Iran rather, can straight up say like, well, we say that's our airspace, which is kind of what they say. They kind of say the U.S. didn't fly over land, but they flew into their airspace. So it's a little bit complicated on this one. But ultimately, nothing really popped off on this. This was one of those, we talked about it on the podcast, because I think it actually happened on a Tuesday, and I was able to talk about it the same day that it happened. And we were kind of in a little bit of a panic because it was like, uh-oh, they shot down like literally a, a 20 or $30 million asset. Like what's going to happen? But the U.S. just kind of didn't really do anything, imposed a few more uh, financial sanctions, which have, again, continued to this day getting worse and worse. And they're just kind of crippling them financially, not doing anything from an, a, a military or an, an active military perspective. However, shortly after the drone was shot down, things kind of ratcheted up a little bit when Iran directly, their military, seized a British oil tanker. Again, traveling through international waterways. Now, this time, several, several rather ship members were taken captive. And if I recall, these were Turkish citizens working for a British merchant, like a British oil company. So now, several other nations were being dragged in by the Iranian militia. It was oil from the UAE, but it was owned by Britain, and it was going to Britain on a British ship that was run by Turkish citizens. So there was a whole thing because all these guys were taken captive, and they technically were representing the United Kingdom. They were flying a British flag, and the military took over the ship, saying that it was in their waters when it clearly wasn't. This one we know for sure. We can see it on the charts. This boat never left the the uh, the shipping channel in the strait. The, I mean, they stole the ship. And uh, if I recall, they like set fire to it. They did a whole thing. Now, in September, rather, of 2019, a story which didn't make the cut here on the podcast, honestly, because it was kind of getting old. Like, Iran was just doing these small things. Um, but uh, something else probably happened this week because it was kind of a big story, but it definitely got buried. I think... This was around the time uh, that the U.S. Um, debates were happening, so it kind of overshadowed what was going on in the Middle East. But a Saudi Arabian-owned oil field was attacked by a combination of drone strikes and missile strikes. Now, it's not really clear um, the difference here, but I believe by by that uh, the the official statements are saying that they obviously had drones firing missiles from the sky, as well as missiles fired from the ground. These are, again, believed to be of Iranian origin, but Tehran has continued to deny any involvement in these or any of the other attacks. This was a major flashpoint, as in the past, to directly attack an oil field, I mean, that's an act of war, right? Oil is a major asset of any nation, let alone one such as Saudi Arabia, who rely almost entirely on oil for their economic success. They have a little bit of gold. I mean, they have a lot of gold, but gold isn't worth what it was at one point in time. Oil is known as black gold for a reason. It is worth a lot of money, and it drives their economy. This was a major oil field that was attacked. Uh, it was a government-owned business that was attacked, so it was a big deal. But nothing came of it. Um, the Saudis did not um, resort to asking the U.S. to get involved uh, from a military perspective. They didn't engage uh, their military, so it just kind of stayed where it is. They're kind of fighting these little proxy wars elsewhere, like my militia is going to fight your militia, but we're both supporting them, and it's kind of weird. But they didn't directly go to war with each other, which is a good thing. So, unfortunately... Um, all this time, so of course, that happened in September. This major oil field was attacked by Iran until December, between September and December. Uh, a few more boats were, were captured by Iran and whatnot. 
But the nail in the coffin here came in December of 2019, towards the end of the month, when Iranian militia and supporters began attacking U.S. military bases across Iraq. Ultimately, in one of these last attacks, killing a U.S. military contractor who was an American citizen and injuring four other military contractors, along with several foreign casualties across all of these bases. The U.S. then responded by returning fire on Iranian military bases. So they just kind of fought fire with fire. Ultimately, after the U.S. responded by returning fire, it all ended in a, ma- a, a, a major riot. I tried to say major and massive all in one word. Doesn't work, it turns out. A major riot on the U.S. embassy in Baghdad, which was essentially captured, set ablaze, all, like for hours and hours until the Iranian military asked the protesters to leave. And it's quite likely that they made a settlement agreement with those protesters on the ground. Now, these protesters have actually been described as Iranian militia. They spray painted uh, the name of a few military leaders on the building, which we're going to talk about in a few seconds. And it was quite clear that this was uh, provoked and controlled by the Iranian military. So they stormed and set fire to an American embassy in Baghdad. The U.S. at this point issued a travel advisory for the entire region, and it came only a few days later. Uh, We all woke up to the news, I'm sure you've heard of it, that uh, Qasem Soleimani, the leader of Iran's Quds Force and the leader of the Middle Eastern military influence, really, was taken out by an American drone strike Uh, seconds after landing at and leaving an Iraq-controlled airport. I apologize. I can't talk today. It's been too long. That's the problem. I need to get back into podcasting. I'm stuttering like I've got, you know, a stutter. But the real question here is, what does this mean for us moving forward? Um, Because we killed someone, I shouldn't say we, the Americans killed someone who... His name was spray-painted right across the front door of the embassy. It said, um, it, the translated version of it uh, was something like, uh, we report to Qasem Soleimani, and then another part, it was spray-painted. This is in Arabic, so it's the, con- you know, translations are what they are. Uh, it said something like, uh, Soleimani is our leader on another part of the, uh, the Baghdad embassy. Well, first of all, the first, like, I would cancel absolutely any trips to the region outside of Israel that I had planned. Um, and even then, I'd be careful. I'd always be careful going to Israel, though. So, you know, but I'd be very careful traveling to that part of the world. Uh, as of right now, commercial flights, uh, Canadian-owned commercial flights, aren't allowed to go to Iran. So you have to kind of stop somewhere else, by what I understand. And they've basically told Canadian citizens to get the hell out. Americans have done the same thing, but I believe there's some American commercial flights still going into the country, which is kind of interesting. But yeah, I would be very, very careful in that part of the world right now, especially if I'm an English-speaking individual. If I'm black or white, I'll reward the area, you know what I'm saying? But that aside, I think the next thing we have to do is to wait and see what Iran does. Because that's going to be the most telling part of all of this. That's going to tell us what the U.S. response is going to be. Because Trump is Trump. He's doing all these crazy tweets. His most recent one was that if Iran strikes us, uh, we will return the favor and not necessarily... um, Uh, um, I don't have it in front of me and I should have grabbed it, but essentially saying that uh, we're not going to return an equal favor. We're going to one up you. So he's basically, and then he threatened like a whole bunch of cultural sites and whatnot, which some people are saying that if the U S was hit and then they returned by attacking a residential, a cultural site that it would be a war crime. Um, I don't see it that way, actually. It depends what site they hit. (laughs) Because if you attack an American citizen, uh, like a site with American citizens, if Iran did that, and then America struck back doing the exact same thing, it's actually, technically, it's not a war crime. So people need to cool their jets. Uh, A lot of people don't like Trump. A lot of Republicans don't like Trump. (laughs) 
they don't like him in what he does. They don't like him for this situation, which I can understand. But right now, they are pulling troops from Iraq. Um, or, or uh, Yeah, they're pulling troops from Iraq because the Iraqi government has come out and sided with Iran. Now, this makes sense politically. It's literally like if uh, Russia kind of had bases in Canada and then Russia and the U.S. started fighting and we had to pick a side. That's literally where Iraq is right now. So even though we've been helping them for all these years, they're like, dude, you guys are on the other side of the world and you're going to bounce the fuck out of here if this war actually pops off. So we're going to side with the guys who are right beside us, which is the same thing we ha- we've we done, right? Like as Canadians, that's what we've done. That's what all the Europeans have done together. They were like, okay, Russia's kind of bigger than us. We're all closer to each other. We're I'm going to fuck with you. You're going to fuck with me. And we're going to not like that guy. That's what Iraq is doing with Iran right now. They're picking the lesser of two evils because no matter which way you look at it, Americans are killing Iraqi citizens and Iranians are killing Iraqi citizens. The only difference is if they want to be nice to the people who are closer to them. They know the U.S. isn't going to be doing major attacks in Iraq anytime soon because they're worried about Iran. So they're going to say, okay, we in Iraq side with Iran and you guys can now fight it out. So that's what's happening there. We're pulling troops from Iraq. Canadian troops are being moved to Kuwait, Americans as well, as and some other places. But the U.S. is trying to keep some troops in Iraq because they don't want it to fall apart. They don't want Iraq to fall to Iranian uh, power, which it seriously might. Iraq is a very unstable country. Uh, they have a very unstable political system. And it is possible that they simply get absorbed by Iran, which... Wouldn't be good, <laughs> to say the least, but it's also like, I mean, you know, let's not over-exaggerate anything. Um, Iraq has some oil fields, but it's we don't need them. We in the West don't need them. Our allies don't need them. Russia is the one who needs them. So we don't want it to fall into Iranian hands because then those oil fields uh, will become Russian assets, essentially, by by extension. But... Ultimately, you know, I don't see this, the idea of pulling out of Iraq, Iran moving in and taking over Iraq. It doesn't increase the threat to us at all. There's no technology in Iraq that that Iran is going to find. Remember the whole weapons of mass destruction thing in Afghanistan? Well, Iraq is literally like a tenth as advanced as Afghanistan was. And Afghanistan didn't have shit. So Iran is the advanced country in that part of the world outside of Israel, right? Um, But the Jews, fucking intelligent. They're the ones who literally developed the bomb for us. Uh, Well, they moved to Germany, developed most of it there, moved here because some uh, actual fascist guy showed up, said he was going to kill the Jews. They came to the U.S., gave the U.S. the bomb. Israel got it right quick after that. For some reason, in the part of the world where in school they teach you that a uh, 1500 year old book is scientific fact they can't figure out the nuclear bomb um, personally I don't find that surprising I don't know why anyone really does I think if Iraq falls to Iran we'll be in the same position we're in now the next question though is why did the US do this now why did Trump pull the trigger now because it's since come out that both George Bush and Barack Obama had an opportunity multiple times, both of them, to take out uh, Qasem Soleimani. So why did Trump do it now? Well, the U.S. has come out and said that there was an imminent threat to U.S. civilian, uh, executive, and military lives. Does that mean there was a threat on American soil? Maybe. Maybe. It literally could be that there was a major, major threat against mainland USA or a mainland American territory or a major allied territory, right? Like, may- like Israel is kind of well protected. They're very good at what they do defensively. So I don't think it would be Israel. But look at Australia, not far from there, right? Hawaii. These are all options. These are all targets. Um, so... It really begs the question if the U.S. will declassify the information that led to uh, taking him out. I 
do actually believe by the response we're seeing, like every single American government institution is who has who has seen it. I shouldn't say institution, but every individual who has seen the information has come out publicly and said, yes, there was an imminent threat and we had to do it. No one is dissenting. And if we've learned anything from watching the Trump administration, it's that someone always dissents and then gets fired. This is the first time he's done a major thing and not one person who's in the know was against it. That tells me there was a big threat. That, to me, is more worrying than what this retaliation might be. Because it, well, we also, they, they've asked the question, the media has asked the question, has that threat been neutralized now that he's been taking out, taken out? rather? And they haven't said that that the threat is completely neutralized, which means we could all still be at risk, right? There could be nuclear weaponry out there that is currently controlled by terrorists that the American government found out about. It's possible. It's possible that the guys in these two cars that got taken out were aware of this weaponry and the U.S. and their allies are trying to take these people out and take the weapon out before it can spread anywhere. If that's the case, we will never find out. We will never find out. The uh, The American government and their allies will never public... Like, that's the sort of thing that if, if these sorts of terrorists had that kind of weaponry, it would never go public because of the, the advertising campaign that it would be for groups um, uh, like... Uh, like um, ISIS and or ISIL, whatever you want to call them, and uh, Boko Haram, and all these other extremist groups. Because if the Iranian militia had a means to acquire that sort of technology, it means that anyone can. Anyone with money can get it. And currently, that's not the case. Currently, anyone who has the technology, like we have to remember, Russia and China have this technology. Neither of those two countries will give it to anyone, right? China shared a little bit of information, and so did Russia with North Korea, and they all went, holy shit, shouldn't have done that. They learned their lesson with North Korea. And North Korea, at least so far, is not an ally of Iran. They're kind of on their own. So we're lucky in that the the country they chose to share the nuclear information with is a country that wants nothing to do with anyone. They want everyone else to die. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're kind of friends with China, and that's where they draw the line. They don't even like Russia anymore. So it's kind of a good thing that it was just North Korea who got that technology. And clearly North Korea has the technology um, to enrich uranium and blow up a nuclear bomb like we know they do we've you can you can read in the atmosphere like we measure like a small earthquake and then all of a sudden in the atmosphere there's like a whole bunch more radiation it's like oh someone set one off and we know it wasn't china we know it wasn't russia we know it wasn't israel didn't happen in europe because it happened you know in asia wasn't japan well there's only one other country there who could have done it and it's obviously north korea Iran doesn't have the sort of allies to give them that technology. The only thing they do have is oil, which they could use. They could use as a means to get some technology from Russia. But I honestly think that Russia does not trust them because of the, uh, the religious extremism in the country. Because Russia not a Muslim country. Russia is a very, um, it's a it's a Christian Orthodox country, right? The Russian Orthodox Church is what controls the country. They are not Muslim. And I think that the, the Russian leaders are smart enough to recognize, just like the Chinese leaders are smart enough to recognize, that if they share their technology with Iran, it will be used against them later on, right? Like everyone sees the threat of extremism. We all see it. We all know. The Russians know. The Chinese know. The Americans know. I know here in Canada. No one's sharing that information with, with Iran. It's on them to figure it out. So far, at least it seems, they haven't yet. But if this imminent threat was a nuclear threat, that's why we haven't heard about it. Otherwise, 
I think they will actually release it. If it's something like, you know, a, uh, a military advancement into Iraq or Kuwait or Jordan or something like that, where, you know, American lives and, and allied lives, I really should say, would have been put at risk, like military lives, then I would say, you know, it was probably good. It was certainly good that we took him out, no matter what. I think if there was absolutely no threat, it's like, fuck this guy. Why does anyone care? Like, not the, not why does anyone care? Because politically, I get it. But, like, I'm not going to sit here and defend someone who's literally responsible for the death of tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people, but certainly thousands of American and allied lives throughout the Middle East. It, this guy is directly responsible for, right? He's been a military leader since the late 80s, early 90s. Fuck this guy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, who cares? His life, not my problem. I have literally no sympathy in his death. Glad he's gone. However, there is a political uh, rebuttal that we're going to have to deal with. Now, speaking politically, the second last question to ask is, was this a political move by Trump to avoid impeachment. Here I, I actually have a very, very hard answer. Uh, no. I don't think Trump is that dumb. I really don't. I don't think he's dumb enough to potentially, like he knew the consequences of this. There's no question in my mind. He's surrounded by people who told him like, bro, this is what's going to happen. If you take this guy out, these are the things they can do to us. Because right away, the U.S. started moving troops around, put out all these travel advisories. Like, they knew. There was no guesswork involved. They knew what could happen. But they thought whatever this threat was, was imminent, and it was, go it was, it was big enough that they had to take him out and take the risk. I don't think he had impeachment in his mind at all. People are sharing tweets like uh, he sent back in the day, like, oh, look, Obama's going to start a war with Iran or whatever. That's political theater. There's there's two very distinct things that, that people struggle with uh, when it comes to um, uh, civil politics. One is that there is a theater of politics, political theater, as it's commonly referred to, and the other is that there is a theater of war. And the two are not related. They are absolutely not related. And the best way to show this is you can go to any person working in the U.S. Congress or Senate or the Canadian House of Commons or the Canadian Senate, uh, the same thing in the U.K., in Germany, Japan, every Russia, like it goes across the board. All of these people will tell you that their military, they both love and support, and they defend their own citizens, first and foremost. If we're talking about like a president had to make a political move and it resulted in the death of 10 soldiers, a lot of people would say, well, that was a political move. That's why they did that. I actually don't have that opinion. I don't think a, a, a leader in the Western world, I don't think there's a single one, at least not that I'm aware of, who would willingly sacrifice lives for a political gain. Don't get me wrong, in a time of war, I am certain, because I understand the way it works, that a, a leader would sacrifice lives for, you know, a gain of land, a, 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 a some sort of military advantage, weaponry, where it's like, we're going to lose 10,000 lives, but we're going to get this. Yes, then they'll go forward and do it. That's very different than saying, Donald Trump saying, you know what, I'm going to kill this guy, maybe start a major global conflict, but no one's going to be looking at impeachment anymore. I simply don't think that's true. And that's one thing I saw on, on all over TV that's really been bothering me because, like, you guys have such a sad outlook on this presidency. Like, I don't like the guy, but I can't imagine living my life thinking that the president wants everyone killed so that he can get reelected. That's stupid. It's simply not the way he works. It's not the way anyone that makes it that far in life works. It's, it's just not. He knew the consequences, and I, I absolutely think that all of his, his, um, his inner circle, the people who were around him when he made this decision, they all were certain that he wasn't making it based on political reasons because the attack wouldn't have happened if that's the case. If anyone in that room thought he's doing this to avoid impeachment... 
I shouldn't say anyone, but most people, they would have spoken up and been like, uh, hold on a second. Because he openly says he likes dissenting opinion, and then he'll fire you later. But he likes dissenting opinion, and he invites it. And we see it around him all the time. So I really don't think that's the case here. The last question is uh, World War Three. <laughs> is it going to happen? Is that what we're faced with right now? Um, and I don't know. I genuinely don't know the answer to that question. First and foremost, I don't know if that's a possibility, like the global warfare, because I seriously think that like a global war nowadays is a 30 minute, 45 minute conflict. And I seriously think it ends up with, um, you know, if we're talking about one of the big three, China, Russia, or the US, then the world ends. If you're talking about the US and Iran, no one else gets involved. I think the US shoots down 90 of 100 nuclear bombs that are sent its way. But really, right now, we're talking about, like, six. So, okay, maybe you can get them in by foot somehow and detonate two bombs, one in Washington, one in New York or L.A., and then the U.S. wipes Iran off the face of the planet. And, you know, there's maybe 40 million American lives and then every single Iranian life that's lost. So that's what I think a world war looks like. I don't think there's going to be a draft. It doesn't make sense. There's no need for a draft. We have weaponry that is far, far, far better than any draft would provide, um, you know, personnel for. It doesn't make sense. Uh, so, no. No World War Three. We can, ch you know, chill out there. Relax a little. Um, feel free to keep getting fat if that's what you're into. Smoke your reefer, your ganja. And, uh, you know, you might as well be high if the world's ending. Because, like, it's going to end anyways, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so I guess what I'm trying to say is now's the best time to try meth if you haven't because you might not have much time left to try it. Personally, I'm not going to, but you can if you want. Um, I also hear that heroin's an option. Uh, speed, cocaine. There's <laughs> Don't forget to subscribe and share the podcast with your friends and family. Tell them all about it. Mention it at work and make sure they know all about the incredible content that is logged and permanently available ad-free every single Tuesday. We're at like 42 episodes in the past, so check one out if you haven't already. As always, thank you so much for the support and feel free to reach out to me absolutely anytime using the contact page over at www.laughtolearnpodcast.com or on social media, which all of those links can be found in the description for this episode. I'm on Instagram, at Jacob Paveo. So you can hit me up there. Or is it at Jacob underscore Paveo? Probably should have looked it up. But you know what would be better? If you just went into the description for this podcast, and uh, if you look there, it'll tell you. But I can tell you it's Jacob underscore Paveo, because I talked long enough to pull my phone out and check it. That's how you host professionally. Really, a professional host would have had that already memorized. But reach reach out talk to me wherever you want to talk to me and i'm just gonna do the same thing i did last time where i fade away from the mic because i don't know how to end it Hooey dog first show of 2020 and i'm already cutting content because i had a whole bunch of uh funny stories to get to and whatnot but i do not seem like i will have the time today but that's okay um I want to get to this year because I'm super excited to talk about my plans for the podcast for this year and, and myself personally. And without any further ado, let's just get to it. I left you guys last year with uh, my personal goal of a new diet of somewhere between 75 and 80% uh, all vegetarian. Not vegan, but a vegetarian diet. So, I can gladly say that I am now on day six, technically. So I'm recording this on January 7th, but on the first, I was a little bit hungover, okay? So I, I broke the rules on the first, <laughs> but I started on the second, uh, and I've been doing, actually feeling really well ever since. A lot more energy than I had before, um, which is nice. Uh, we'll see how it goes. It's one of those things with a new diet, as always, that like a weekend, you never really know. Uh, but so far, it's interesting. You realize how much meat you eat when you're like uh, trying to slow down. So basically, what I'm doing is I'm eating meat during one meal every day. And it's like a small portion of meat with a majority of vegetables on the plate still. So 
Uh, typically, what I try to do is breakfast and lunch, all vegetarian. Um, and then for dinner, I'll do like a meat or a fish. Um, and it's it's hard, <laughs> really. Like when you look at like a commercial, a TV commercial for food, you realize that everything is meat. You know, you're watching like sports and it's like burgers, chicken wings, chicken fingers, chicken nuggets, uh, you know, steak. It's uh, there's a lot of meat in everyone's diet. So it definitely becomes difficult. But I'm so far I'm doing fairly well. Uh, I already found one new recipe that was really good. It was a red lentil curry, which is something that three weeks ago I would have been like, <laughs> not eating that. Um, but today after the podcast, uh, I love Brussels sprouts. I know I'm weird. A lot of people hate them, but I love them. So I'm uh, trying some Brussels sprout chili tacos. So I'm looking forward to that. But yeah, so far, new diet, going well. Now, for the podcast, um, I mentioned at the top of the show that I didn't really take any time off. I had all these plans for what I was going to do. I was supposed to take uh, a few days off over the holidays, but uh, I'm not joking when I said there was an actual accounting emergency. So you become an accountant hoping that you never have to get called into work for anything. (laughs) Turns out you sometimes do. So I didn't really get any time off, but I'm going to be taking a day off later this week, I hope, hopefully Friday. And uh, my plan is to design a new logo. So you should be seeing a new logo pop up, probably not this week, because there's like a a process I have to go through to get it. You know, I have to make it and then render it and then that's all the same process, but then push it through to all the podcasting platforms. So uh, it could take up to like a month for it to completely roll out. But you should see an exciting new logo show up. And yeah, but don't fret because it's the exact same show. I'm not changing the podcast feed or anything like that. Um, I've also heard people say that there's some podcasting apps that like don't allow you to change the photo. It just won't change if you do change it. So some of you may see the same logo keep showing up forever and ever and ever. Um, uh, But yeah, so I'm planning on doing a new logo. So on social media and whatnot and on the website, uh, you might see a new logo show up in the next coming weeks. Definitely over social media and the website is where you'll see it first. And then uh, for the podcast, it'll roll out um, as I upload new episodes moving forward. Moving backwards, I'm not going to go and re-upload all the pictures and stuff. They're just going to stay the way they are. So it's going to be one of those prospective changes. So a change moving forward as opposed to a retrospective change, which would be moving backwards as well. The next thing that I want to plan for are more conversations. I don't really like using the word interview because I don't like, like, I don't want to be an interviewer, you know? I don't want to just be like, oh, okay, and uh, how did you get started? And how do you feel about where you are now? And are you excited for the future? Like, that's not me. But I love doing the conversations I've had on this show. Um, Many of you, I'm sure, are waiting for that marijuana episode. I am too, quite frankly. But uh, my guest has been, uh, I guess, stoned for the last couple of months, which should come as no surprise. But he has not shown up to do it yet, and I'm angered by that. And he might be listening right now. Likely is, so damn to you. Uh, But it's going to happen eventually, but who knows? Uh, Who knows when? But I do want to do more conversations. I've had a few people reach out who want to do conversations over the internet. I'm not going to do that. Um, I don't want to be talking to some, I hate talking to someone on Skype, like for personal reasons. I sure as hell don't want to be talking to someone over Skype for this podcast. Cause that's just too much stress for me. It's already a shit ton of work to put it all together and whatnot. Um, so basically if we can't get to the same room together, it's just not going to happen, but I'm kind of fine with that. Um, I actually have found that the conversation podcasts, although I enjoy them much more, they don't do nearly as well uh, for numbers. So I'm not really sure why, but I'm still planning on doing some. Uh, right now, I do have a few lined up that I'm supposed to do, but they'll kind of come out when they come out. And uh, I'm actually quite content with the uh, the one-man show perspective. Maybe I'm egocentric. Uh, when I say maybe I'm egocentric, that's my way of saying... I'm aware that I'm egocentric. Uh, So it's probably just going to be a one-man show. But if there's anyone you really want me to interview, hit me up and hit that person up. Like, send a tweet with the two of us in it or something. If it's, like, Justin Bieber, 
uh, he's not going to see that. So d not yet. You know, we got to grow a little. <laughs> but if there's someone legitimate, uh, send it. I can travel. I'm not barred from any nation except I will not go to China for reasons that if you listen to this podcast, you'll be well aware. Um, and I don't know that I would be allowed, to be perfectly honest. And um, yeah, Mexico, not really a big fan, you know, anywhere that I could land and potentially get arrested just for landing there. You know, I avoid those places. But if this person lives anywhere other than like somewhere where either the police have no control over the citizenry or there's no like dictatorship or anything like that, I'll fuck with Cuba. I mean, I'm not a big fan of Cuba, but I'll fuck with it. You know, if I have to go there to interview someone, no problem. I'll go and I'll lay on a beach. It's cool. I'm a Canadian, so I can get in. Uh, but for the most part, uh, you know, send a tweet with the two of us in it. Maybe we make it work. Other than that, though, um, I'm uh, also investing in new software. So right now, I use a, uh, a rather shitty software platform, uh, Audacity, for those of you who are aware of it. And it's just like a free thing that I picked up because it's the easiest way to start podcasting. But I'm going O-fish, official, and uh, I'm going to be picking up a much better software for recording, uh, which I'm excited about, but... <laughs> I'm also going to have to record a few episodes well in advance. Uh, so there may be some episodes not recorded on Tuesday, which I'm not a big fan of because I like being able to, you know, uh, write out some of it during the week, write out an active story on Tuesday. And like today I had to wait because I don't know, maybe something big would have happened with Iran today. Turns out nothing did, <laughs> but I like to leave it up so it can, can happen. But there may be a few weeks um, coming hopefully this month. Uh, that are recorded on uh, Saturday or rather uh, Sunday or Monday. That way I can, you know, make sure everything works. I don't have to re-record them or anything like that. Um, so, but I'll let you know if I'm recording anything earlier so that you're aware that uh, it might not be completely up to date on, you know, all the information. Uh, next is an exciting one. Uh, this may not impact many of you, but... Uh, you'll definitely see it on social media. Uh, I'm planning on getting like a small run of clothing done for the Laugh to Learn podcast. So if you see me or family or my family or friends uh, around, you know, everyone knows that I live in Southern Ontario. So if you see us and you live in that area and someone's wearing a Laugh to Learn shirt, you can like shout that person out. Um, I'm not going to be selling anything yet. Like, I don't want to make money off it. Nothing like that right now. I don't have the size of audience where I can sell t-shirts yet. Uh, but it's all to do with this new marketing campaign. I'm going to be actively pushing this show uh, for this year. That's my goal for the year is to really push it. And a big thing is word of mouth. So for everyone listening, it's really important that you just tell people about the show. Shares on social media are awesome. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, it doesn't matter. Anywhere you share it, that's like incredible. It's so exciting every time I see someone share it, especially this the first time someone shares it. I notice it every single time. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, it means a lot. It's just I kind of look like a loser if I go and like every time someone shares my podcast, right? But I have like on average somewhere depends on the show between 50 and 100 downloads so if like say 35 people share it i see all 35 but i'm not gonna go around and like you know like my own podcast 35 times so uh, i might shout out shout you out once in a while throw a like once in a while but i can't do it every time you know what i'm saying i gotta maintain this kind of thing like i'm cool um even though we all know i'm not uh but uh i see it every time you guys share the podcast and i'm super grateful for it and uh, word of mouth is the big thing. So, uh, you know, I actively bring it up with people every time I meet a new person. They're like, oh, what do you do? Me, I'm an accountant, but I also podcast on the side. You should check it out. And, you know, tell people by word of mouth because that's how you get people to download podcasts. It would mean a whole lot to me if someone was like, yo, I heard about it from this person. Oh, did you see it on Facebook? No, they came up to me and told me. That would be sick. Um, also... Oh, and I'm doing this whole like I'm gonna you're gonna be seeing probably Facebook ads and Instagram and um, Twitter and like whatever promoted promoted posts. Um, 
And of course, those ads, because of the way ad targeting works, are going to go to people who already listen to my podcast. So all of you are going to see those ads, which is exciting. But please don't click on them because I pay per click, right? So you already know about it. Don't click on it. <laughs> go to, you all know to go to www.laughtolearnpodcast.com to get all the uh, the news or my Instagram or uh, you know or the uh, the podcast feed on your favorite podcasting app. I'm also making a commitment to do uh, a complete episode every single week this year, so we're not going to miss a week. Uh, that's the plan, at least. Who knows? Uh, Iran could attack all major Canadian infrastructure, and like next week, I can fail on this because there's no internet. But the plan right now is an episode every single week, um, at least half an hour in length. I want nothing below half hour. Uh, and yeah, so that's the plan, and I really plan on sticking to it. Also, for this entire year, I plan on having no ads and no paywalls. Um, I talked about it last year that I was given an advertising opportunity that I turned down. Uh, and I really don't plan on doing anything like that yet. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. I I've said it before that I kind of have the ability to do this podcast for fun and just grow my audience naturally, not have to worry about making money. Uh, it's the first thing people ask you when they find out you have a podcast is how much money does it make? Um, like me, mine literally costs me money to do. I don't make any money. I pay to keep it up and you know, it's just for fun, but I'm also in a position where I can do that for fun and it works. I don't have no kids. You know, I just have my dog. He doesn't cost for it. Where is he? This might be like one of the first times I'm recording and Benny's not here. That's sad. I don't know where he went. Well, he's not dead, but he's just not beside me. Um, but he doesn't cost much. <laughs> so, you know, his toys, maybe like $30 a month. His food, maybe like 40 to $50 a month. And then I have to bring him to the vet like once a year. So it's cool like that, you know? Dogs, not that expensive. I mean, if you don't have a lot of money, don't go get a dog. Now I'm going to have PETA after me. Look what you did, Jacob. Anyways, speaking of... Uh, all of this, uh, the last thing is before the end of the year, uh, I plan to have a permanent studio set up, which is super exciting for me. Literally means nothing for any of you, but you can be excited for me. Uh, I plan on having a full studio capable for uh, podcasting that is like right now, I have to come in and plug everything in. I actually broke a PS4 controller today because I haven't recorded in. Uh, three or four weeks. So I like had my mic behind all this PlayStation stuff that I'd pulled out, who knows, looking for something over the break. So then I'm plugging shit in and this PlayStation controller goes flying and breaks, blah, 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 whole scene. Uh, but my plan is to have everything permanently set up uh, and with the so sizable so I can come in, have conversations with people. I don't have to find new mics. Everything's just always plugged in, ready to go. Uh, I'm also going to have music capabilities so I can uh, get back to uh, maybe doing some session recording for people, which I'm excited about. And um, yeah, like I'm p uh, planning for an isolation booth and all this stuff. So it's super exciting. Uh, and 2020, I have this thing that um, I don't think I mentioned at the end of last year on my last episode, so I'm going to mention it now, where a lot of people... Uh, look at things like, well, you know, uh, everyone has bad days and let's make tomorrow a better one or whatever. I look at life year by year. And my goal when I'm basically like, when I'm lying in my deathbed, what I want to be able to say is I made every year better than the last. And I can tell you for sure, 2019 was better than 2018, 18 better than 17, 17 better than 16 and on and on and on. And I plan on making 2020 better than 2019. So I've got this podcast going, and it's just going to keep on going. And we're all on this journey together. So thank you all for your support. I'm super pumped for a new year, clearly, because I've been rambling for like half an hour. Uh, and yeah, thank you guys so much for checking out the podcast if you are new here. Next week will be a full week of news and comedy and entertaining bullshit, basically, because that's what I do. So thank you all for being in my head, because what you're hearing on this podcast is basically what goes on in my head 24 hours a day. Now you'll all know why I'm crazy. Uh, you've spent your hour with me, so you can go back to normalcy. Um, I'm going to keep going like this, because, as I said, 
This is the way I think 24 hours a day. So you can feel bad for me from afar. And uh, yeah, thank you all for listening. Once again, this has been the Laugh to Learn podcast. I really encourage you to take all the discussions here about Iran and everything exciting that's coming in 2020 out to the real world with your friends or family. Share with me your goals for 2020. Tell your friends to listen to me and share their goals with me for 2020 over on Twitter or Instagram. And as always, this podcast is completely ad-free. All I ask is you share it with those friends and family. Subscribe. If you're here for the first time, please hit that subscribe button on whatever podcast podcasting app you happen to be listening to it on and tell your friends about me each and every week until next time ladies and gentlemen please 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 keep on laughing and keep on learning